Hello everyone, it's me, Ivan Van Norman. Becca's out of town this week, so I get a chance to show you the amazingly awesome Axis and Allies in Zombies by Avalon Hill. Now this spin on an old classic pits two to five players in a strategic battle for military dominance. Except now there's zombies. Lots of them. It's terrifying. And it's set in alternate World War II timeline. So the five major powers, Germany, Japan, Soviet Union, the UK, and the good old US of A, duke it out while trying to avoid the zombie apocalypse. Now setup begins with players breaking into two teams, Axis versus Allies. And each player selects a power from the appropriate side. And if there are more powers than players, then some players will control multiple powers. Now each player will take their player aid with their setup chart on one side and their unit stats, technology bar, and turn order on the other sides. Players will gather their color coordinated pieces and their national control marker, which is used to indicate various statuses in the game. Next, place the game board on the table. Various spaces in the game are divided by borderlines and act either as territories, in the case of land spaces, or sea zones for water. Now some territories in Axis and Allies and Zombies are neutral and thus impassable and unattackable for either political or geographical reasons. However, some zombie cards in the game may create an outbreak on a neutral territory and at that time it's no longer neutral and is completely conquerable by world powers. Now each side follows their setup guide to place their starting units and the territories and sea zones on the board. You can use gray, green, or red plastic counters to denote one, three, or five units of a single type. Place them under the unit to show how many are present. Now players will place a control marker on the national production chart along the bottom of the board. This represents the power's income each turn and is the sum of all income values listed on the controlled territories at the start of the game. Now as territories switch hands, players' markers will fluctuate on the production chart along with their income. Money is represented by industrial production credits and each player begins the game with an IPC equal to their starting income. Lastly, shuffle the zombie deck and set it near the board with room for a discard pile. Now the game ends in two different ways. First, if one team controls all of their capitals in addition to one capital of an opposing power, that team wins the game. Second, if the zombies control 25 IPCs worth of territories, they overrun the world, and at which point each power will take one more turn. Now the game ends, and the side that controls the most IPCs in zombie-free territories wins. Okay, let's talk about gameplay. Now, Axis and Allies and Zombies is played over rounds, during which each player takes a turn. At the end of each round, a check for victory step occurs to see if any side, or the zombies, have won the game. The order of play is as follows. Soviet Union, Germany, United Kingdom, Japan, United States, followed by the victory check. This order is repeated until somebody wins. Each power's turn is divided into eight phases. Play a zombie card. Zombies attack. Zombies capture territories. Combat move. Combat and capture. Non-combat move. Purchase units and collect income. I know it seems like a lot, but most of these are pretty simple. In the play a zombie card phase, the active player draws a card from the zombie deck and performs the actions listed. The desperate measures section is an optional rule that you and your players must decide to either include or ignore at the start of a game. These actions give players bonuses or special technologies in order to fight the zombies, including explosive artillery and chainsaw tanks. <laughs> They're just awesome, so just include them. In the zombie attack phase, the active player controls any territories that also contain zombies, those zombies attack. Now for each zombie token, roll a zombie dice. On a D result, the player removes one of their combat units from that territory. And if it happens to be an infantry unit, add a zombie token to that territory because your dead soldiers rise from the dead. Next, in the zombies capture territories phase, each territory that only contains zombie units becomes zombie controlled. Adjust the IPC marker for the zombies, and if it was previously controlled by another player, lower theirs. The exception to this rule occurs if the territory has an industrial complex, which means it needs a combined number of zombies in that territory that exceeds the IPC value of the space. Phase 4, Combat Move. Because there are two distinct movement phases, combat and non-combat, 
This phase is meant for any units who end their movement in a hostile space. And by hostile, I mean controlled by an opposing power or by the zombies. When combat moving, a player can move any number of units up to their individual move value, which is located on their unit chart. And if a unit tries to move through a hostile territory, they end their movement in that space. Some exceptions exist for blitzing tanks and sea zones, but see the rulebook for more details. All movement in this phase occurs at the same time, and once all combat moves have been declared, play will continue to the combat phase. This means that a player cannot do a combat move, then do combat, and then move again, because the second move is for non-combat moves only. Next, combat and capture. Like the combat move, all battles occur simultaneously. But to resolve the outcome, the attacking player should choose a contested territory and play that battle sequence through to completion before fighting another territory. Now we'll come back to combat steps in a second because, you know, <laughs> save the best for last. After combat is resolved, it's time for the non-combat move phase, where the active player now moves any units that didn't activate during its combat move. During this phase, no units can move through or into hostile territories. Exceptions include aircraft and submarines, which have special circumstances for their movements. Next, the active player may purchase units by spending IPCs up to the cost of the units they wish to add to the board. Place those units in territories that contain an industrial complex or recruitment center. The number of units they may add is limited to the IPC value of the territory producing units. Additionally, recruitment centers can only produce infantry due to the limited industrial capacity of that territory. Finally, in the collect income phase, the active player gains IPCs equal to their power's national production level. Now one note about finances, if a power loses their capital, they can no longer collect IPCs in this phase until they've regained control of their home. Other powers are not allowed to loan or give IPCs to their allies or their enemies, so don't lose your capital. It's kind of debilitating. And that's the turn order. Gameplay cycles through each power until the victory check occurs. If no one has won, the round begins anew. Now for combat! Which follows a very orderly sequence. First, place units in the contested territory on the battle board, depending on their respective side, attacker or defender. Arrange them so that units in the shared combat value are in the same column. These units will roll together when the time comes. Additionally, if there are any zombies present, place their tokens on the battle board as well, in the Z column. And after all units are placed, if any submarines are in the battle, they can use their surprise strike ability at this time. Next, the zombies bite. Now for each zombie unit on a board, the defender rolls a zombie dice. Now for each A result, the attacker moves a unit to the casualty line. For each D result, the defender does the same. Now one unique note here, air units can't be attacked in this step because zombies can't bite planes. Next, the attacking units open fire. Now the attacking player rolls a die for each unit on their board with the same attack value. Results equal to or lower than the attack value score a hit, and the defender assigns hits to their units by moving units below the casualty line. These units will still be able to return fire in the next step. Additionally, any excess hits rolled are assigned to the zombie units if there are any in the battle. Also, each result of a zombie headshot instantly kills a zombie removing it from the board. Next, the defenders fire back, and the defending player rolls dice in the same manner, including all their casualty units. Results equal to or lower than the defend value score a hit, and the same results apply for excess hits killing zombies. Now, after all the rolls are made, players remove casualties from the board. If any infantry was removed, add a zombie token per unit. If any side's forces have been completely eliminated, combat ends. If some units still remain, the attacker can either continue to attack for starting the combat sequence from the beginning, or they can choose to retreat, moving their units to an adjacent friendly space. Some exceptions exist for sea units and amphibious assaults, but in any case, all units have to move together to the same space. If the defender wins, they keep the territory and play continues. If the attacker wins, control of that territory switches to their power. Adjust the national production chart accordingly as players vie for control of the world. Territories will switch hands on a constant and violent basis. Once a team controls all of their capitals and at least one opposing power's capital at the end of the round, that team wins. And that's the bulk of Axis and Allies and Zombies. Some specific rules for canals, islands, unit characteristics, and more can be found in the rulebook and its handy appendices. My name is Ivan Van Norman, and I invite you to watch me and my friends play this game on Game the Game, right here on Geek and Sundry or ProjectAlpha.com. See you.
sociedad.